of the department, Department of Management Studies, Dhananda Sagar College of Engineering. Happy to welcome you all to this uh, today's PK Prakla lecture series. This platform is uh, uh, is an opportunity for the youngsters and the faculty member who are in the field of management to share uh, wisdom from the industry people. It's a very interesting industry interface for our faculty member and then students to update themselves. And today we have with us. Uh, uh, Dr. Sumit Mitra, uh, CEO of uh, Tesco Global uh, Business Services and uh, uh, Tesco Bangalore. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mitra, to accept our uh, invitation to honor us. And uh, I would like to introduce about uh, Dr. Mitra for a small, in a brief way. Dr. Mitra is a versatile uh, senior executive and board member with over 20 years experience in outsourcing, P&L management and client management and business transformation. A strategic thinker with a shrewd commercial acumen and experience in building and managing large globally diverse teams. His track record and execution is through his unique ability to join the dots in a complex multinational environment and making things simple. Dr. Mitra is currently the chief Executive Officer for Tesco PLC's Global Business Services Division and CEO of Tesco Bangalore NTIC. Dr. Mitra is also a board member of uh, Tesco's joint venture with the Tata Group, that is Trend Hypermarket and Booker India. Prior to joining Tesco, Dr. Mitra was the managing director of British Telecom, where he conceptualized and executed this is global business services model with a direct responsibility for 10,000 plus employees across nine countries and several third party vendors. Sumit led BT GBS to one of the top 25 best employers in India and Budapest as the best shared service center in Europe. Dr. Mitra studied in Scotland and has a bachelor in medical sciences degree and a master's in business administration. He has completed the global strategic management program from Harvard Business School in Boston and has received an honorary doctorate in management excellence. Dr. Mitra loves sports. He holds a cricket coaching diploma from the England and Wales Cricket Board and is an expert in martial arts. He's a passionate Manchester United supporter, loves traveling and enjoys spending time with his two daughters. I really welcome Dr. Sumit Mitra to have you here and uh, talk about the topic leadership and career progress progression with, with our young budding managers and the faculty member. Happy to uh, here, um, invite you, sir, and then uh, uh, without much shadow, I would like to hand over the session to our budding managers, uh, moderator of today, uh, Sumant and Vidya. Over to you guys. Uh, Thank you very much, Doctor. Yeah. Um, it's always a, a real pleasure and honor uh, to uh, represent an university, to, to, to be here, to talk to. And especially what I particularly like is talking to uh, students. Yeah. I always believe in youth. I always believe in uh, the future. And, yeah. and you are the future of this country and the world. Uh, so it's important. Um, one of the things I always talk about wherever I talk about is doesn't matter whether it's engineering, whether it's sciences, whether it's medicine, whether it's working in corporate life, whether it's um, you know any profession, lawyer, whatever you do, there is one thing that is common in life, which is leadership. Uh, unless, until and unless you have the right leadership skills, uh, you're not going to be successful. And some of the leadership, and there are many, many books written about leadership. You know, um, in fact, Hemel and Prahlad, you know, um, 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 Minzberg, you know, number of people, there are a number of leadership gurus around the world. Michael Porter, he talks about competitive strategy. But there are a number of people who have talked about leadership. But what I've learned through my life is leadership uh, is something which is acquired. You, you, you learn from uh, around you and build your own leadership style, your own uniqueness, which I'm going to talk about today. So um, today's topic, I'm going to talk about leadership in a, in a VUCA world. 
Uh, what is VUCA? I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. VUCA is live right here, right now. And I'm going to talk you through that. And then what I thought would be good to make it a bit relevant uh, is who am I to, to talk you through leadership? Uh, so it'll be good to talk to you a little bit about my career journey. I have a, I've had quite a unique career journey. So I want to talk you through that career journey. And hopefully that would help you in terms of your thinking, help you to make the right career choices that you would like to make in the future. But before I start off, I want to talk a little bit about Tesco. Um, it'll be a shame if I don't talk about Tesco. So Tesco um, is the third largest retailer in the world. We have 440 colleagues around the world in eight countries. Uh, we have one joint venture, as I talked about, the Tata uh, Trend Hypermarkets, which I sit on the board of. Uh, we have 6,800 stores. We have um, uh, 300,000 colleagues in the UK alone. We roughly make about uh, 60 billion pounds. This is not dollars, pounds of sales. And then we do roughly around another 10 billion of petrol. So if you add that, so that's about 70, 72 billion pounds of sales. That's almost hundred million dollar business. And if you think about, there is 90 million shopping trips a week. So our customers would make 90 million shopping trips. So while I finish this lecture, uh, we would have had probably something around um, 200,000 customers visiting our, our shops uh, as we speak uh, during this time. So that's Tesco. Uh, we are the largest food retailer in Europe. And like every business, we have been impacted by COVID uh, and COVID, uh, but Retail is a very resilient business uh, because especially food retailing. But because it's a resilient business, and as you know, it doesn't matter what recession happens, whatever happens, people have to buy food. So our business sales have gone up significantly. Our online business uh, went from 600,000 orders a week to 1.3 million orders a week. Um, so we almost doubled the size of our online business. We have incredibly uh, um, increased our store business. Um, but when your business goes up, it comes with the responsibility of feeding nations. Because what we are doing here is there are people who are vulnerable, people who are suffering from COVID. There are people who are self-quarantined. And it's very important, the countries that we serve, we feed those nations. And that comes with a lot of responsibility. I don't think in my 20 years of working career, I've ever been so proud for working for an organization who is feeding nations. So anyway, that's about Tesco. So let me, you know, the VUCA world that I talk about, uh, what does VUCA world mean? VUCA world is the word actually came from US Army when they were fighting the forces in Afghanistan many, many years ago. So they called uh, the fight as VUCA world because they didn't know who their enemy was, because they came from anywhere. They could be a person sitting beside you, a suicide bomber. It could be a child carrying a bomb. It could be anybody, it could be gorilla sitting up in the mountains and shooting them. So, they, so before, army would know who they're fighting with. But when they were fighting the, in Afghanistan in the Northwest frontier province, they didn't know who their enemy was. It could be anybody. So they defined it, the VUCA world, and VUCA became a big word in the dictionary of business nowadays because we live in a VUCA world. So VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And I would explain what that means. So let me give you some examples of VUCA world. VUCA world is not what is happening now. It's been there for the last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. So let me share with you some examples of VUCA world. So you probably all seen this and know this. This is the dreaded Corona, COVID-19. So if you want to experience a VUCA world, it's right here, right now. It has changed the whole dynamics of the world. It's changed the whole, um, the way the people think about business, the way the businesses are done, the way um, work happens. We never thought that 100% of our workforce will sit at home 
and, 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 and deliver a service for a retailer supporting our customers. We didn't know that bankers would sit at home and work from home. So it has changed the world. But VUCA world is not new. So if you remember uh, in 2008, 2009, we had the financial crisis. That's yet another example. Who uh, would know that Lehman Brother would collapse as a business? And it sent a, a shockwave around the world when the financial collapses happened. The share price prices plummeted across the business and, and the whole world went into a deep down recession. And if you think about that recession was bad, times that by 100, that's coming our way. And that's because what was happening there was volatile, was uncertain, was ambiguous, was complex. Then if you think about Brexit, if anybody predicted 10 years ago that Britain would come out of Europe, you know, you quit kidding yourself. But Brexit happened. It has happened. The people voted. And that's created another VUCA world. And that's a VUCA world because it's volatile. It's uncertain. You don't know what trading alliance will happen with Europe, with, with um, UK. You don't know whether the tax would change. You don't know what recession would hit. You don't know what will be the impact of your supply chain because of, of kind of the divorce from Europe. Then if you think about, you probably know this gentleman. If I was a betting man 10 years ago and betted money on Donald Trump to be the president of US and Brexit happened, and if I would have put in a thousand dollar on that bet, I would have won a billion pound. So nobody ever thought Donald Trump would be a president. And that's the book of world because all the decisions that he's taking around the world, it's different. I'm not gonna say whether it's good or bad, but it's different. Nobody ever thought uh, of the way he speaks, the way he talks, the way things he does, uh, the knee jerk reactions that he makes, it creates uncertainty, it creates volatility. Now, here's my prediction. Uh, in the VUCA world, you never know what's gonna happen. I hope you know this lady. This lady is called Kim Kardashian, uh, probably one of the most popular uh, social media ladies. And the prediction could be, she could be not the next one, but the next US president. Who knows what VUCA world would throw at us. But what VUCA world gives us is our ability to create a differentiation. And what we need to do as leaders, and this is where the leadership kicks in, is how do you deal with the VUCA world? And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about. So I said the context of what VUCA world is, it's volatile, uncertain, but now it's about how do you deal with it? And, how, and if you remember, uh, Michael Porter, Michael Porter is one of my favorite, favorite business management gurus. And Michael Porter talks about creating something different. And that differentiation creates a competitive strategy. And being different, to deliberately choose a strategy that is different. And that differentiation creates your competitive advantage. But differentiation doesn't grow on trees. So this is my belief that if you want to transform and do something different, you got to think differently. So it almost, you got to stand in front of a mirror uh, and think that although you're a cat, but you see your reflection as a lion. And that's what differentiation is. How do you do that? So let me give you, you know, there are many books written on it. So what I'm going to talk to you about is my four or five um, pointers on how to deal with VUCA world. And this is based on my experience. So five principles. There are hundreds of principles. I'm going to only talk about for the purpose of today's lecture, talk about five, five principles to deal with the VUCA world. So number one, this is a wartime leadership. This is things are changing around you. This is not time for BAU leadership. This is wartime. And during wartime, this is things are changing every second, every day. Technology is changing around you, IoT, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, you know, RPAs, these are all around you. And these are changing and disrupting. So that puts you in a wartime footing. And in that wartime footing, how do you deal with it? It's very different. It requires a different set of skills. 
knowledge and attribute to deal with the wartime leadership. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that. So what do you need first thing in volatility when things are volatile, bubbling around you is a very strong leadership. So you're on rough seas, right? And as a leader, if you think about, you're sitting on that yacht as a captain, as a leader, and you're on this rough seas. And if you panic, if you are not calm, if you're not planning your move, if you are nervous, you're not gonna sell this ship and it will create panic around your business. So a strong, decisive, panic-free leadership is the first step. And that comes from self-reflection. That comes from not being a hero because what's important is you can't do it all yourself. You need to make sure you delegate, you make sure you delegate the work to your leadership team and beyond. So that this is, you're not a Superman, you're not a Batman, you're not a Spider-Man. So you're not going to really excel if you try and be the hero and try and do everything yourself. Gone those days, those days are absolutely gone. It's very old leadership style when people used to say, leaders lead from the front. Leaders don't lead from the front. Leaders lead from the back. Leaders set up their teams to deliver and execute. They stand there to correct course. They stand there to support. They stand there to challenge. Because as a leader during this time, you must push your team to aim high. Because if you aim for the moon, you will land on top of a coconut tree. If you aim for a coconut tree, you will stand on the grass. So what's really important is have unreasonable expectation. But on the same time, if you only have unreasonable expectation, it's not gonna work. You need to ensure that you support your team and say, it's okay to fail. It's okay to take risk, but it's okay to fail. I am there as a safety net to catch you when you fall. Because then that gives the challenge and the support at the same time. And that to me, that is true leadership. If I challenge people all the time and I say, oh, go and jump in the deep sea. Go and really jump into this deep sea. But tell you what, if you fail, it's your problem. People will be nervous and it will create panic. So what's really important, really, really important is you ensure you provide the right support culture. And in the same breath, when you challenge, you say, what support do you need? How can I help you to make things happen? So that's really important. And as I said, smooth seas do not ever make a skilled sailor. So if you really want to be a big, big leader, so dive in to the deep end, dive into the storm, dive into this VUCA world, that will train you, guide you, help you, and make you the smooth sailor and a skilled sailor that you want to be. So that's leadership in a nutshell on volatility. Next thing is being decisive in uncertainty. So when there is uncertainty around you, you don't know what's happening. You got to be decisive. What you can't do as a leader is you change your mind every two seconds. You say, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. You shouldn't, absolutely shouldn't do that. You got to make a decision, you got to be decisive. And sometimes you will hear a lot of noise around you because it's uncertain times, people will have opinion. Different people will read different things. Somebody will look at a WhatsApp message. Somebody will look up some fake news. Somebody will look up some other news from other TV channel. And then they will all base their opinion on what's happening. But as a leader, you got to listen. That's very important. But that listening cannot go on forever. So you got to be decisive and say, right, I've heard you all. This is the decision I'm going to take and I'm going to live by that. So the solution for that is don't sit on the fence. 
never ever sit on the fence. Uh, there is one um, leader I used to work with and, and he once taught me that, Sumit, don't sit on the fence for so long that your backside is red. So what I'm trying to say to you is never sit on a fence. We are paid as leaders to take decisions. 80%, 60%, 70% of your decisions will be right. But 20% of those decisions will be wrong. It's okay to make a wrong decision. But what's not okay is not to make a decision. Because then that's static. Anything that is static is finished. You got to change, you got to evolve, you got to move it. Anything, somebody who've read physics would know motion is life. Anything that is static is dead. So what's important is you got to keep it going, keep it moving. And if it requires, you got to change course, you're allowed to do so. I'll give you a, an example from um, Tagore and Gandhi. Gandhi was a big fan of Tagore. Um, I hope you've all heard of Tagore um, and, and of course Gandhi. So Gandhi and Tagore uh, were good friends. And Tagore, um, many, many uh, years ago, um, when Gandhi was starting the non-cooperation movement, he was a bit confused and he thought, is it gonna work? Is it not gonna work? Will I get the right support from the people? So Tagore wrote a, a poem, a, a song for, for Gandhi, which was called Akla Cholore, which became famous from the movie called Kahani, which was sung by Amitabh Bachchan. Uh, Akla Cholore means it doesn't matter if people are not behind you. It doesn't matter uh, if you think something is right, if the whole world or a part of the world doesn't support you, you carry on, you carry on. So that was that all about. And when Gandhi was invited to Tagore in Shantiniketan, in a book, a uh, visitor's book, Gandhi wrote, if you have a mission you a, and a vision, make it your life and make sure you give your whole heart and soul for that mission and vision and give everything to complete that mission. But Tagore, being the philosopher that he is, he wrote underneath that and said, if you realize that mission and vision is wrong, abandon it halfway. And that's okay. And that's what I'm trying to say is, it's absolutely okay if you've taken a decision and the decision halfway through you realize needs to be changed. It's okay to change, but make a decision. So that's the second point. The third point, I hope you know this character. In the world of complexity, when things are complex, when you don't understand it, you got to be curious. You got to ask questions. You got to make sure. And this guy, you probably have seen, and I'm telling you my age now, um, this was a very famous detective in the 80s um, called Karamchan. And Karamchan used to ask a lot of questions. So it is a big art. Teach yourself the art of ignorance. It's very easy to be a leader and say, I know everything. I know what I'm talking about. No, you don't. You don't have the patent for all the good ideas. So you got to ask the right questions. You got to ensure you listen. You got to teach yourself the art of ignorance. You got to ask the why question. That is really important. And curiosity doesn't kill the cat. Curiosity makes you a better leader. So that's the third point. So if I move into my fourth point, it's dealing with ambiguity. When you're dealing with ambiguity, it's very cloudy. You are de dealt with fake news. If you remember, um, uh, you know, during uh, Donald Trump uh, presidential election, America was full of fake news. Uh, I remember I was in US at that time, I picked up a paper um, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, one of the news in there uh, was um, Hillary Clinton had alien babies. And this was a, a, a front page news. Can you beat that? Um, you know, that is fake news. And, and that was a very obvious fake news. But nowadays in media, you don't know what is true, what is not true. Um, he who shouts the loudest tells a story, but you don't know which story is right, which story is wrong, who is making it up. 
So as a leader, you will get a lot of data. You are inundated with data. And sometimes it is ambiguous. Uh, you got to learn. And, and what I've seen in my leadership journey in the last 20 years is a lot of leaders fail in this area. This is probably the most important area. Unless they do the nth degree of analysis, and I call it paralysis by analysis, people would do a lot of analysis to get to the nth degree. And until and unless they know everything about everything, they won't take a decision. And that goes back to the point is, are you taking too long to take a decision? It is okay. It is okay not to know everything. It is okay. So if you know 50, 60% of the fact, take a decision, make a decision. It is okay. And you should be comfortable to deal with ambiguity. And that's what I'm trying to tell you is deal with ambiguity is probably one of the biggest skills that you would require in the future world to deal with VUCA. The last one, over communicate, but effectively. So I've got a little cartoon here. What do I mean? I don't mean over communication. So this lady here is asking the gentleman who is sitting there saying, did you see the note I left you on your monitor? The guy says, yes. And then she says, did you get my voicemail? Did you get my email? And then in the end, she says, shall I actually tell you what I've written on my note, voicemail and email? So she's over communicating, but is bugging the life out of the gentleman who's trying to work because the same message is coming 100 times in 100 different sources. So what's really important as a leader is to communicate and over communicate and over index your communication. Because during VUCA world, people are nervous. People are out of their comfort zone. People are dealing with something that they haven't dealt before. So what's important is you give them clarity. You, and sometimes tell them the truth. Be authentic in your communication. Sometimes it's okay to say, sorry, I don't know what's going to happen. But so they know that you're in the same boat as they are. It's okay to say, I don't know. But tell you what, we will sail through this. So over communication, but effective communication. Well, how does effective communication work? Effective communication is about managing. Effective communication is managing it in bite-sized chunk. So I'll give you an example. So I, instead of writing long emails, because nowadays, if you look at the millennials, if you look at you know, your generation, people don't like reading. Uh, long emails or, or long communication. People like watching. People like watching YouTube. People, uh, and that's why you know YouTube is so popular. So what I do is uh, to to attract the millennials, to attract the Generation Zs. Uh, um, I do a three-minute video every day, every week on a Monday, to talk about what's happening. Talk about the priorities for this week to talk about what's happened the week before. So it gives them the knowledge, it gives them in a bite-sized chunk, it gives them clarity. And, and in a world where you're not meeting people face-to-face, -face, a video message makes them feel that everything is okay. So effective communication, short, sharp, concise, getting to the message, but be authentic in your communication is really important. Um, as I said, over communicate, but effectively. So what does that mean? So if you see that picture that I've put up, it, how do you unclutter people's mind? Because people, colleagues who are working for you, they're nervous, they're conscious, they are worried about what's going on. So their mind is really clogged up. So your communication should be in such a way that it gives clarity. Even if it doesn't give clarity because you don't have all the information, it gives some kind of norm, normal view. It gives sometimes uh, some kind of steadiness. Sometimes it helps people to say, it's, it will be okay and be positive because you can think always in, in a glass you know, this glass is, you can look at it in two ways and say, is it half empty or half full? As a leader, I can choose to communicate that glass is half empty, but I always choose to 
communicate as glass half full because during difficult times during unprecedented times people need a light under the tunnel people need hope and as a leader it's important to give that hope not false hope but hope and finally um i want to talk about a little bit about my journey um and why uh you should listen to me and why you should hear me talk so i think it's important i give you a little background about my journey so i was 16 17 years old when i left india um and i decided to go into uk um as a young boy and i didn't have any family i didn't have any relatives uh, friends so i decided um to go and do my what we call the higher secondary so i did scottish hires in scotland and i i didn't i took 20 dollars 20 pounds from my pep family and i left for uk uh, to study in the uk my college was supposed to start in august and then i went in and i worked um in the first few months to earn some money so i worked in number of restaurants i have uh, cleaned dishes i have um you know uh, supplied home delivery number of things i've done and in the end i became a chef um i ran a restaurant as a chef um and i trained myself to to be a chef then as a chef i earned a lot of money as a student and i decided to be an entrepreneur and i owned a restaurant 25% of a restaurant you can still look up that restaurant the main branch is gone the franchise is still there it's called the indian cavalry club in edinburgh i owned that restaurant uh, um uh, partly partly um and what was important was um that i learned in many restaurant i owned restaurants to help fund my education because what was important is to fund my education and as an entrepreneur it's not that i was working full time i was uh, working part time i was um uh, supporting my education the fees that i need to pay uh, to fund uh, my education and my living expenses so i became an entrepreneur um, there are restaurants like um in dundee there were restaurants in where i own steaks and while i was doing that i was studying to be a doctor um so i i studied doctor and i passed my medicine and now you think what's going on with this guy so i i studied medicine and i passed my medical sciences course and then i decided not to be a doctor uh because what was important and i then did a bsc degree from dundee university because i was confused why was i confused i was confused because i thought you know i was doing very well as a and i found my real niche in business and i felt i really enjoyed my business but my parents always wanted to be a doctor wanted me to be a doctor and i was confused because i was thinking you know i'm really good at this business i'm really good at being an entrepreneur owning restaurants and i was very good at being a chef what if i fail as a doctor because i've studied for 5 years i've become a doctor but what if i'm not successful what if i don't enjoy it and these all these thoughts came into my head really came into my head so i bought some time and did a bsc a bmsc degree um to see do i want to go and do some research or not so it took me a little while uh to get my head round and while i was doing that i um somebody advised and 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 i thought what would be really good is if i go into hospital management and i could use my medicine degree and also my entrepreneurial business skills as well as um uh, you know i would enjoy both and i could be a a, a hospital manager or be a hospital or run an nhs on national health service trust i could do that so that was you know when you are very young you think about all this and i applied for many many jobs in nhs i didn't get a single job and i thought 
what is going on. So I got myself a mentor who said, look, if you want to go into management, you need to get yourself a MBA degree. So that's the next thing I did. I did do an MBA degree to help me brush up my management skills. But the plan was still there to go into NHS, National Health Service, and run a hospital or run an NHS trust. So I did my MBA. And no, I'm not wearing a skirt. I'm wearing a, a Scottish kilt. This is the Scottish national dress. A kilt. Uh, this was the day I graduated from MBA. And I remember all my life I studied science. And I went into my first lecture of macro and microeconomics. And people were teaching about law of diminishing return and utility. And I thought to myself, what the hell have I signed up for? And I just really, really need to kind of get out of this. But then I did strategy, marketing, uh, finance, and I really loved and I felt I am duck to water and I really enjoy what I did my MBA. I got myself a first class in my MBA uh, and then I joined a telecommunications company called uh, British Telecom, where um, I did a number of roles and every 12 to 18 months, I changed my role. I did sales, marketing, contract commercial management, procurement, finance, you know, a uh, number of roles, strategy, and then ended up becoming um, a business leader and, a, and one of the youngest managing directors in BT. And then from there, I joined Tesco as uh, the CEO of, of Tesco Global Business Services. So that's my career journey in terms of being a chef, being a owner of a business, to a doctor, to an MBA, to um, uh, you know, the business leader that I am today. And do I look back and regret? No, not at all. I think I love the journey that I've taken. What has medicine, you know, medicine is the odd one out in the middle. Uh, and what has medicine taught me? Medicine has taught me the art of empathy. Empathy is probably the biggest skill, biggest uh, uh, attribute that is required of a leader in the next 30, 40, 100 years. Empathy helps you connect to your colleagues. Empathy helps you to understand the pain of your customers. Empathy helps you to understand the pain of your stakeholders is putting yourself in other people's shoes. And that empathy has really helped me to be the leader I am today. And that medicine gave me a discipline of studying hard labor, uh, hard uh, way, you know, hard graft um, to understand human and human feelings. And that has made me the leader that I'm today. So, if there is one advice I can give you is success is never by chance. Success is through, I would say, enrich your life by giving it variety because variety is the spice of life. Make the right moves, take risks. If you don't take risks, you don't learn. And failure is the pillar of success. You will fail, but that's okay to fail. Move on. I failed many times in many things, but you don't brush yourself, dust up and stand up again. And I'll finish off this lecture. Uh, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions for me. To give you one philosophy of my life, which has always worked out, is life's battle is never won by the bravest, cleverest, or smartest. Never. It's won by people who think they can win. So it's the positive mental attitude. Doesn't matter wherever you're thrown, whatever is thrown at you, as long as you believe you can win, you will win. Where are those people who talk to your classes? Where are those people who, uh, you know, but teachers pets? Where are those people? It's not about being clever, being smart. You need, of course you need that. It's about emotional intelligence. It's about believing that you can win. And finally, I want to say thank you very much for being such a patient uh, audience. And uh, I wish you all the very best for your career and your success. Dr. Mitra, thank you very much for sharing your inspiring journey with us. If we were in an auditorium right now, you would have probably heard a huge round of applause. Uh, but um, you can be rest assured that that's playing out virtually right now. Uh, we do have a set of questions uh, that the students have put together. 
And uh, to take you through the q and I'd like to call upon uh, Sumanth Naik and Vidya, please. Yeah, thank you, Rahul, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sumanth Naik. I am a semester two student at Dayananda Sagar College of Engineering. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Mitra, sir, it was really a good presentation. Uh, you took us through the overview of Tesco. Uh, later, you spoke regarding the VUCA world, uh, which gave us an idea, uh, the leadership in the current scenario. Uh, you also explained about your career journey as well. Uh, so we have a couple of set of questions we would be asking you in this regard. Uh, to begin with, uh, a little bit more on uh, to understand Tesco Global Business Services in detail. Uh, we have some questions from the students, so we will start with our first question. Uh, it is regarding Tesco. Uh, is it fair to view uh, Tesco Global Business Services as a captive shared service establishment? Uh, why do certain companies prefer uh, the captive strategy over uh, outsourcing? Really good question. So let me answer the first one. The word captive, I hate that word. Captive means somebody who has been chained and somebody who is a slave. And that was how it all started was, if you think about in the early 90s, when the outsourcing started, it was, how do I please my customer and do whatever my customer in the UK or US telling us to do, and, and, and we do that. Those days are over. And organizations who continue to do that are failing miserably to deliver the benefit of a truly global business services. A truly global business services is not about captive. It's not about a shared service. It is about, it is the organization itself. It is a horizontal that sits across the markets to support your business. And the whole objective is to free up your colleagues in the markets whether it's in the UK, whether it's in the US, whether it's to spend more time with their customers, to spend more time with the suppliers to drive profitable revenue growth. And your global business services is a hub for innovation, a hub for business partnering, a hub for delivering net new skills for the organization where you are joined and connected at the hip. It is not a first class citizen and a second class citizen. You are equal. I report into the board of Tesco. I have equal right than anybody else across the planet in Tesco. My every single colleague working for business services, whether they're sitting in Budapest, sitting in UK, sitting in India, they are no different to a person who's sitting in the headquarters. It's exactly, we are the extension of the headquarters. And the quicker, people who run this business understand the better that is. So there is the reason why Tesco Global Business Services is one of the top 20 most admired global business services in the world. And that's the reason for it. So it's about partnership. It's about innovation. It's about driving value. It's no longer about labor arbitrage. India is cheap. India is not cheap anymore. You pay peanuts, you're going to get monkeys. So if you want real talent, you have to pay well. And it's no different to UK or anywhere else. So the concept of labor arbitrage, anybody who's trying to do business in India and thinking about labor arbitrage, they're stupid. It is about talent. It is about how do you leverage the talent to create the value for the organization. That's number one. Number two, no, it's not about in-house capability, building a shared service or a business service versus outsource. Everybody, it is an ecosystem that we play. It is about augmenting your resourcing to get, and my philosophy is, is getting the right skills at the right time, at the right place, at the right cost. So tomorrow, if I need five resources in Poland, and if I, I don't want to set up a huge center for five resources, 10 resources, I will go to a third party, to a vendor to help set up. If there is a complex project which needs niche skill set, like for example, we were rolling out Oracle and Oracle uh, Fusion. You know, we don't want to be a company which has hundreds of people knowing Oracle Fusion. 
we will hire a third party to support us. So what is important is how do you work as a true partner in that ecosystem? If you think about innovation, innovation these days, unlike 15 years, 20 years ago, where innovation only happened in multinational big organizations, it doesn't happen that way. Innovation now happens through startups. And if you say, oh, startup is not within my organization, I'm not gonna work with them. You're the biggest fool on the planet. So how do you leverage that ecosystem? How do you work with the colleagues around you? How do you, uh, how do you get the best out of that ecosystem? Whether it's third party, whether it's startup, whether it's your own in-house capability. That's the differentiator that Michael Porter talks about. Okay, okay. thank you, sir. Uh, I request Vidya to ask the next question, please. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Vidya, second semester MBA student at Dayananda Saga College of Engineering. Today, I'll be moderating along with Suman. We are so honored to have Dr. Sumit Mitra serve with us. And uh, thank you so much, sir, for taking time of your busy schedule and uh, giving us this wonderful opportunity to interact. Now, um, moving on to the next question, uh, one of the most relevant um, questions to the current scenario, we would imagine that remote working to present challenges that are unique to the nature of the given business or industry. So what sort of roadblocks has Tesco Bangalore has faced and how have you kind of driven your teams to help and overcome them? Yeah, you know, good question. Um, as I said before, that when you're a food retailer, um, when you see the crisis around the world with COVID, it comes with a lot of responsibility because you have to feed nations. And Tesco as a group cannot function without global business services and technology. Uh, so what was really important for us is to ensure that you see the issues up front. So almost in February, we were, we were monitoring the situation in China, Iran, what was happening in Italy, you know, those were the early countries who got hit by COVID. So what was really important is to understand the dynamic where we operate. So I have a center in, in Budapest, I have a center in, in Brno, I have a center in um, um, Dundee in Scotland, I have a center in, in Bangalore. So what was really important is look at the dynamics and get yourself prepared and adopt and adapt yourself to the change that's gonna come. We knew that people will panic buy food. We knew things would happen. Just to give you an example, as I said to you, our online business doubled itself uh, in three weeks, which is unprecedented. We are already a four and a half billion pound business from an online perspective, we doubled it. We, from 600,000 orders a week, we went to 1.3 million orders a week. So we had to get, and, and Bangalore supports that, and we had to make sure we are ready. Now, India, so let me start with Budapest. Budapest was easy. People had broadband at home. People had desks, chairs, tables. People could go back and you say, okay, I'm switching off the office. You guys work from home, no problem. All we had to do is make sure the laptop works, the infrastructure works, etc. Dundee was our contact center where our customers would call. Customers were panicking. Our call volume went up by 576%, 576%, which meant we had to hire 800 new people in the UK to deal with that because what we couldn't have is customer waiting for hours on the call to talk to us. So what we did was we hired 800 people in three and a half weeks, but those three, 800 people has to sit somewhere because office doesn't have the capacity to bring in another 800. So we put 1100 people to work from home. So we created, and remember in a contact center, people work on desktops. So we moved those desktop infrastructure into people's houses so that people can work from home. Bangalore is a different story. Bangalore, I have finance, I have architects, I have technologists, and not all people have broadband at home. Not all people uh, live in an accommodation where they have a space to work from. People live in small apartments where they share with their in-laws, where they share with their family, their children, children not going to school, which means they're all there. 
who is going to look after those children so it created a lot of we went really early early as early as early first week of march we rolled out broadband into people's houses who didn't have broadband paid for by tesco we um, ensured that 99% of our workforce were all ready and working from home by 15th of march because we could not afford to let our customers down we could not afford to let our uh, colleagues down in terms of volume in uk alone in uk alone 52000 people working in tesco were ill 52000 they were either ill they were all showing symptoms of covid or they were vulnerable like they had cancer or they had uh, asthma and they couldn't come out so they self quarantined themselves 52000 people these were colleagues who were serving the shops and when the customer comes in when 52000 people are not available what do you do so what we did we hired 48000 new people on temporary contracts from companies who were letting their staff go so these were airline companies hospitality sector who were letting their employees go we hired them and which meant that added 48000 new volume into bangalore who were doing the payroll activity so what was important though is in all all this is to keep the motivation level up for our colleagues so what we did was um this was one of my brain child was i felt that it was important to fill the pulse of the organization because once we lose our colleagues and we can't motivate them the motivation level goes down we have lost it because we can't see them eye to eye on a regular basis we can't touch them feel them talk to them people are sitting isolated in their house so i started what we call a pulse survey where every day 3 seconds i ask three questions one how are you feeling today how was your yesterday and what help do you need so the whole organization would fill in and then we realize that people need chairs people don't even have chairs to sit on people don't have mouse people don't have this people don't have that and over 1 and 1/2 thousand people were supported through this survey and we then realized the mood of the organization just went up exponentially over a period of 3 months we knew by name people who were suffering people were suffering mental health issues people were suffering from claustrophobia people were suffering from domestic abuse people were suffering from different things and we put in those intervention individually on a one to one basis to support those individuals and that helped us to see through this hopefully that answers your question that you asked yes yes uh, thank you sir uh, we now want to understand in your presentation you mentioned about trend hypermarket limited so uh, which are the operators of star bazaar so to enter india's uh, vast retail uh, you had a jv deal with the trend hypermarket limited in the year 2014 so for our students who are viewing this webinar uh, can you please enlighten us uh, on this strategy uh, the present scenario and what will be the road ahead okay so just to be clear the company the joint venture is called trend hypermarkets and the brand under the trend hypermarket is called star star bazaar um okay so tesco obviously saw india as a growth sector uh this was before my time 7 uh, 8 years ago and you know the fdi regulation in india that if you are a multi brand retailer you can't retail in india but <clears throat> if you are a single brand retailer you can like ikea you see ikea sony you know all those retailers can retail but tesco couldn't because we are a multi brand retailer so we had to come into a joint venture so we looked at different organizations but we felt tata because of their history because of their culture because of their values because tesco is very values led and we wanted a partner who is values led who takes care of their employees so and we felt tata was a right fit for us so we worked with trend which is a a, a company under tata 
and we formed a joint venture of 50-50 partnership with Trent and Tesco. It's called Trent Hypermarkets. It's a joint data and Tesco enterprise uh, to create the, to disrupt the market and create uh, hypermarkets. Now we started doing that. Uh, we lost our identity a little bit. Tesco was very much focused on UK and Europe, uh, did not put enough resources to help grow this. We thought it was an investment, it will grow, but it didn't happen. Um, over the last 18 months, uh, I've come on the board. Um, we made some changes. Uh, we have got a new CEO who comes from Europe who was the CEO of um, Little and uh, CEO of Little. Uh, he comes with a new fresh pair of eyes. We looking at um, how do we position ourselves in the market? Which customer segmentation do we cater for? What do we want to be? And then we realize we want to be value driven. We want to be everyday value for our customers. We want to be known for our quality which is the Tata quality. And we need to be, our differentiator is our fresh grocery. Because nobody does fresh the way we do in India at the moment. So some of the food you will pick up from Trent hypermarkets is probably plucked that morning. So the food that you will get is fresh and as fresh as you can get. And that's what we focused on our values, our ethos, what do we stand for? And that's what's working. We are now piloting our new brand. We are rebranding our business so that people are clear what we stand for, what our core values are. And you will see over the next few years, there will be significant investment in India. When I say significant, it will be investment in India to grow our capability into the four states that we are in, in Gujarat, in Maharashtra, in Karnataka and Andhra to ensure that we grow our, our shares because nobody, no, nobody will tell you otherwise. There's not a single retailer has cracked the Indian market. Nobody put their hand on heart and say, oh, I'm making good profit in cash. Nobody's doing that. I think the opportunity in the Indian market is immense. I think if we play our card right, if we do it properly, if we execute our strategy, we will create a real disruption in this market. If you haven't been to a Tata uh, Tesco store, Star Hypermarket, I suggest you go. We will not be beaten on value for against any other company. If you can find it anywhere else, please write to me. You will not be beaten. And our own brand is called Fabista, where yeah. we sell our own brand. We will not be beaten on price on that one. And the quality I can, guarantee you it comes with Tata quality. And Tesco is known for quality in the UK, as you know. So everything is quality checked. Everything is, is quality planned. So hope that helps to give you yes. a yes. little understanding. Right, right. So having said that, uh, talking a bit more about Tesco and India's retail landscape, we know that India's retail uh, space is very crowded today. Uh, so what are your thoughts on what it takes to search ahead of the competition? Yeah, as, as I said, I, I really don't think, um, I really, really don't think, um, can you hear me? Yes, sir, yes. Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, as I said to you before, I, I don't think any retailer has cracked this market. Even if it's congested, it hasn't cracked it. I think what people are looking for is quality because you see a lot of news, you see a lot of things where uh, you know, um, food quality isn't the greatest. And because of COVID, people will care about their health. People will care about the quality of food they consume. And quality and quality at the right price will be the differentiator. And I think we will create that differentiator in the market. Okay. Uh, so next question. Uh... A lot of these students uh, in this webinar are MBA grads. Uh, I'm sure uh, they would want to uh, know the answer to this question, what I'm asking. So when your business units hire employees, uh, what tenets do they look for uh, in a prospective employee? 
So I have a follow-up question as well. So what do you think the core capabilities that uh, an MBA grad must possess uh, when he or she hits the job market? Good. First question. I, yeah, the degrees are important. Degrees are discipline, right? Do I particularly get worried about whether they're coming from IIM or IIT or Dianand or anywhere. No, I don't really particularly care. I care about the attitude. That's the most important thing. Do you have the right, right attitude to learn? Because the world is for the learner. The learned sit beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. So are you ready to learn? Are you ensured, ensuring that you will learn every day? And do you have the attitude to do the impossible. If you have the right attitude, if you're positive, that's the person I'm looking for. You know, intellectual caliber, if you've done your MBA, it's a given. If you've done your MBA well, yes, you have that intellectual capability, that's a given. But are you bringing your whole self to the business? Are you being you? Don't try and be what you're not. The second question is be curious ask questions. It is important is not to get a job. The important is, is that a right fit for you? Is the value, is the organization, is the strategy, is the leaders that you're going to work for fits you? Because nothing worse than job hopping every 12 to 18 months. It ruins your CV. I worked for BT for 16 years. It's really important. It builds the loyalty that you show If you really want to go at the top, you got to show brand loyalty because that's what the organization is looking for. Gone those days where people job hop every three years. Then they very hardly make it. Look at Sundar Pichai, how long he's worked for uh, Google. Look at Satya Nadella, how long he's worked for uh, Microsoft. Really important. The loyalty to work for a brand is very important. So be curious, ask the questions, be inquisitive to make sure it is not just a fit for the organization, but whether you are a fit for the organization, but is the organization fit for you? That's important. That's it from me, really. Yes, sir. Yes, right, yes. Stop. One last I'm question. sure these words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. I'm conscious yeah, of- I'm sure these words of wisdom surely help our students. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other final question before we close off? Yes, sir. We just have one last question to take up. Uh, yeah. uh, what are the emerging industries that MBA students must be aware of as they build their related skills? And also just a follow-up question, sir. What are the top three action items that must be present on an MBA student's to-do list? Okay, good. So first question, I mean, data is the new oil. You know, it is the new oil. So data analytics, data science is the future. Well, it's the present and the future. So that's an area you guys should think about. You should consider you've got to be data savvy. I'm not saying everybody has to be a data scientist, but you got to be data savvy. Second thing, you need to understand technology. Technology is a big disruptor. You got to love technology. I'm not saying you need to know how it's coded and how uh, AI work, but you need to understand how can you leverage AI to create value as a business leader? How do you use machine learning? How do you use IoT? How do you use cloud of clouds to ensure that helps your business? So technologies will talk jargon. Jargon, cut out that jargon. Think about value that you create for the organization. And the final thing I would say is um, the space of automation, robotics, it is also technology, but think about how do you make yourself redundant? That's really important because when you make yourself redundant, you ensure you move up the value chain to acquire new skills and new attributes. So when you get into a job, always think about how do I make myself redundant? 
because the organization is not stupid if you make yourself redundant they're not going to fire you they will think oh this guy is a genius he's replaced himself with a bot or a machine or a tool or whatever and now we must give him another opportunity to do something somewhere so think about that and the final question was around uh, what are in the checklist of an mba student number 1 your intelligence is there iq is there think about eq emotional intelligence read up on emotional intelligence there's some fantastic books by daniel goldman read up on that um emotional intelligence is a real tool and nowadays 90% 100% of all our ceos around the world are higher on emotional intelligence than in iq i'm average iq guy but my emotional intelligence quotient is very very high so that that's what's important the second thing is as i said be curious be curious ask questions ask don't think your learning is complete post your mba keep learning keep learning and third thing make sure you use your learning in practical life sometimes we think oh that was a separate thing i did in university and this is a new thing i'm doing in 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 office it's different no it's not different you need to bring the theories that you've learned into practice in real life and some theories you think okay belbin has said these things who said belbin was right who the hell said that you have an opinion so make an opinion tweak on belbin's theory tweak on models and implement it so that will help you to grow your career thank you sir thank, thank you, you so sir. much yeah uh, sir uh, we thank you for sharing us a great insight on leadership and career journey i'm sure uh, we will have so many takeaways from today's show so uh, i request uh, professor rahul to take over Please. Dr. Mitra, uh, I'm sure we could have gone on for another half hour, but I do believe that you have a hard stop. Uh, thanks once again for sharing uh, your career journey and breaking down the book of world uh, for us this morning. Uh, Dr. KJ Hemalata, thank you for getting a hold of uh, Dr. Mitra amidst his busy schedule as well. Uh, we'll definitely uh, continue to follow you on uh, the social media platforms, uh, Dr. Mitra and uh, Sumanth and Vidya, thank you for the Q and A as well. Our final um, words, uh, Dr. Mitra, I want to leave you with the final word. Look, I, you know, all I want to do is is wish you of all the best for your career, uh, for your future. It's difficult times at the moment, uh, unprecedented times, but be strong, be positive. Positivity is the key to success. Be positive. Good things will happen to good people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Your positivity is the key. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was the CK Prala lecture series. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Until next time, goodbye and good luck to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.